Okay, are you, are you guys all ready to get going? Yeah. I think so. It's kind of clock, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, hopefully you, you all can hear me okay. In the back row, can you hear me if I'm talking okay? I don't like standing behind the microphone and up on a podium and all of that, so this should work out just fine for both of us. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Mark Majeski, and I'm the coordinator of this presentation. So you're here for understanding the student-athlete experience within your student affairs world. So hopefully you're in the right spot. But I'm excited to host this, this presentation and talk a little bit about this uh, because I think it's a very important topic. And I'm pleased that NASPA is hosting, I think, three sessions today. This is the first of three, so hopefully you can participate in the other one as well. Since NASPA has created the student athlete knowledge community, I think a lot of good things have started to happen. Uh, partnership with the NCAA has grown and strengthened, and I think it's going to continue to grow. And from my own experience, talking with people within NASPA and people within, the student, within student affairs, there's always this kind of thirst for yeah, athletics. What do we do about athletics? And for a lot, I think, of student affairs divisions, athletics has always been kind of just over here someplace. And there's this big concept of integration of athletics into the overall educational experience, which I think is important. But at least in my experience, a lot of people are still hesitant. They don't know exactly how to approach it. And I think a lot of the good work starting to happen within NASPA, starting to happen on many campuses, is going to help with the school piece. Because I think athletics needs some help in a lot of ways. So to give me a sense for who's here, how many of you are student affairs professionals? Oh. Are there athletic department people here? Okay, a few. And any other departments that just wandered in? Okay, good. So that gives me a sense uh, for who's here. Um, you know, another question. So, how many of you, we're going to talk about the student athlete and student athlete experiences. Obviously, that's the topic for today. But how many of you have experienced? Or like we are tired of this stereotype that student athletes are just a bunch of knuckleheads. That they only care about sports. You hear that, that, that they're thugs, that they're only in school to play the sport, right? So we hear that a lot, and that's a lot of the perception. So how many of you, like me, are tired of some student athletes actually living up to that reputation? <laughs> yeah. So that happens as well. We're not really here to talk about that aspect, although the work of student affairs and the work that we're, things that we're going to talk about today do relate to that, but that's, that's another topic for another session. We're really here to give you an idea of what student athletes' lives are like and identify ways that you, as student affairs professionals, can work with athletics, <coughs> staff, and with student athletes to build a much better support system. Because I think student affairs truly is about supporting student success outside of the classroom. And that's all students, including student athletes. So uh, what I've identified here are three and a half keys to enlightenment. And I'll explain that in a few minutes. But the idea is to hopefully give you some things to think about that you can localize for your own campus and take that next week and start to have some more conversations. This session is too short to get into anything in any great detail. When I first submitted this proposal, I had this whole grandiose plan for what we would do here. Then I got the reception back and I said, you have 50 minutes. Well, we can't do a whole lot, but we want to give you some things to think about here. So why is this important? For me, I spent my professional career in higher ed working in athletics, 21 or so years, most of that time as a director of athletics. I've been on small campuses, Division three environment, all of which reported through student affairs. I've been a senior student affairs uh, officer, you know, in my role on all of these campuses. When I decided to leave my last campus, which was Willamette University in Salem, Oregon, I was there for 11 years as the AD, I was starting my business where I'm going to focus on athletics in, in the small college environment primarily. And I started talking with a lot of different people that I knew. Presidents, vice presidents of student affairs, athletic directors, faculty members, to talk to them about what, what is it about athletics? What are the issues facing athletics that maybe I, in my new role, can help people with? 
And so there are a lot of things with fundraising that are just operational things. But one thing I always made sure I asked people about was their student athlete experience. And I think you're talking about student athlete experience. And without exception, everybody would say, oh, the student athlete experience is the most important thing we do. We must provide these young men and women with an experience that helps them grow emotionally, intellectually, and as leaders. It's the most important thing we do. Right, God, that's, that's the right answer. You got that one right. So, but now here's a follow-up question. How would you define your student athlete experience? Describe it to me. And they kind of pause. They say, well, I don't know. We're, it's, it's good. We provide all sorts of opportunity. Okay, that doesn't say a whole lot, so maybe you need to clarify what that is for yourself. And I said, next question, how are you doing with your student athlete experience? Are you doing a good job? And there would be a longer pause. And they'd say, why? Well, well, we're graduating kids. Oh, good GPAs. They're, for the most part, good citizens. And they'd go, okay. But they struggle articulating what the student athlete experience is and how good a job they're doing. So the whole idea, I think, is in order to work better within your campuses with student athletes and providing the good experience and supporting them, you need to first understand it and then work together to provide a much better situation than perhaps you are doing right now. So that's why I started to get into this business. And on campuses in which I've worked, understanding the student athlete experience better has led to much better things within the athletic department across campus and provided some much better results. Now, today's panel, unfortunately, you'll see Vanderbilt University was set to be here. David Williams, who is their vice chancellor for university relations and athletics and athletic director, was all set. Unexpectedly, late last week, he had to withdraw. And it's really unfortunate because I think Vanderbilt is a great example within the larger school, Division I BCS world, that does a great job with athletics, student athletes, and integrating things into the overall educational experience. That's okay. We're going to make you we, I tweak some things. We also have Mark McCorney, who's with us. Mark is the director of athletics. <laughs> He's going to run his fan club. That only cost him about $35. <laughs> and dinner. Uh, Mark is the director of athletics at Benedictine University in Illinois, Division III campus. And Mark, since he's been athletic director there, has really done some innovative things to work to develop not only the student athlete experience, but work with other units on campus to develop programming and support services that really are meaningful to student athletes. So we're going to hear from him, and that's really our uh, goal here is to provide you with some information and some things to think about. And you know who I am already. If we can get you to have a more clear understanding of student athletes and what they're going through, if you can then think about some of these things as it relates to your own campus, and if you can leave here identifying at least one thing that you say, you know what, I learned this from Mark and Mark and we need to talk about this on our campus, you'll be better off. So that is your challenge, really, is to really focus on action from this session. And if you do that, you'll be better off. Or you could just be here hanging out and sipping coffee and killing time for the next session. I don't know. You're going to be better off if you actually use this and plan some action from it. Along those lines, you don't have to answer this. We're not going to ask for volunteers. But think about your student athletes, what's happening on your campus, how you work with your athletic department, how well, how not so well, and one or two, maybe three things that you think are important. So just think about these things and keep them in the side part of your mind as we talk about what we're going to talk about. And you'll be able to start making some connections, I hope. My three and a half keys. The reason it's three and a half is that I have a simple brain and I like to work in threes and I couldn't quite keep it to three. So I, I squeaked in a half there and the half that you're going to see by no means means it's less important than the other three. It's just the way that I had to work with it within my brain. 
first one here, if you look at Stephen Covey, you, you might be familiar with some of his stuff, and understanding is an important one, and the whole idea here is you need to be able to understand, and I think understand from the other person's perspective before you start to you know, work with them in any kind of effective way. So understanding is the first key here. The second key is to develop some opportunities for meaningful collaboration, okay, and that's working together. And a key for meaningful collaboration is first understanding. So this is not only directly with your student athletes, but with the athletic department staff, top to bottom. You need to make sure that you're coming together with an open mind, with clear understandings of what each other is trying to accomplish before you can work well together. The third key is some sort of assessment. And boy, assessment is a big word in student affairs these days. And what I find interesting is that all the books and all the research out there, they talk about student affairs assessment. It always stops at campus recreation and intramural. There's nothing about athletics assessment. That's another session, another topic that, that we'll tackle one day. That's not what we're going to talk about, but the point here is, if you're going to go through all this trouble of understanding what you're trying to do, develop working relationships, and then implement some things that you think are important and helpful to students, make sure that you're following up to find out, is it working or not? And implement some sort of assessment measure. Now, here, you ready? Drum roll. The hack is not minimized at all because it's a hack. This, if you don't already realize it, think about this. The, re the relationship, the powerful relationship between coach and student athlete is one of the most underutilized resources on your campus and especially within student affairs. Remember nothing if you can just remember this because this can impact your operation. That's called leverage. I'm going to show you a brief video, okay, that is intended to capture how student athletes think. Bear with me, it's only about two minutes long, but it's very powerful. It's not about getting a scholarship, getting drafted, or making sports center. It's a deep meanness that comes from the heart. We need to practice, to play, to lift, to hustle to sweat, to run. We do it all for our teammates and for the student in our calculus class that we don't even know. We don't practice with the future Major League First Baseman. We practice with the future sports agent. We don't lift weights with the future one of the wrestler. We lift with the future doctor. We don't run with the future Wimbledon champion. We run with the future CEO. It's a bigger part of us than our friends or family can understand. Sometimes we play for 2,000 fans, sometimes 25. But we still play hard. You cheer for us because you know us. You know more than just our names. Like all of you, we are students first. We don't sign autographs. But we do sign graduate school applications, MCAT exams, and student body petitions. When we miss a kick or strike out, we don't let down an entire state. We only let down our teammates, coaches, and fans. But the herd is still the same. We train hard. Lift, throw, run, kick tackle, shoot, dribble, and lift some more, and in the morning we go to class. And in that class, we are nothing more than students. It's about pride in ourselves in Cornell College. It's about our love and passion for the game. And when it's over, when we walk off that court or field for the last time, our hearts crumble. Those tears are real. But deep down inside, we are very proud of ourselves. We will forever be what few can claim. Cornell College athletes. Have any of you seen that before? Anybody from Cornell College here? Okay, I stole it from them, but it's YouTube property, so I'm not going to bring it in. It's not the right 
Obviously, that's about Division Three, and that's where this first was circulated, actually, as an anonymous essay. And it started making its way through Division Three about just a great statement and testament to what Division Three athletics was about. Now, it applies to any level of affiliation. And when you think about that, what, what I'm moving into next here is we often have perceptions about what student athletes are like and how they behave and who they are. Lori introduced herself and she says, I'm here just to learn about student athletes because I have some of them in my residence halls and usually I only deal with them on judicial matters. And that may be very familiar to many of you. That is common, but we also generally think across campus sometimes and certainly off of campuses that student athletes are a certain way. And I think in order to effectively move past that, even you folks that might have a little better understanding, it could discard everything you might perceive about the student athlete. If you look at men's basketball and football and remove them from the mix, they're a very small percentage of the overall student athlete population on your campus and in the, in the, in the uh, kind of higher level <coughs> system. Every other student athlete really reflects, I think, what you just saw in that video. They care about being students. They care about athletics, absolutely. But they are identifying with your institution. And they want to represent your institution. And it is a part of them that is very, very important. So I want to ask you this. And we're going to get through a couple other things. But if you think about student athletes for a second, what do you think is the biggest stressor, the biggest challenge for your student athletes on your campus? Time? Balance? Yeah, that's exactly right. In, in my work, the biggest issue is time to do everything. Okay? And they are very committed to, they've got their athletic commitments, they've got their academic commitments, and their study time. Those two things take up probably 90% of their time. The other part of their time is usually like health, wellness, you know, sleep. Okay? And then way down on the list after those things is a social life. And if you ask student athletes, they say, yeah, I really don't have much of a social life, and I can't go to certain things, or I can't participate in the student affairs program because it's at a time that's not convenient, or I'm just too tired, okay? And you know what, it's not that they don't have a desire, it's that they simply can't fit everything into their day. And part of the issue is, it, that leads many people to the issue of priorities. Well, are they spending too much time on athletics? And should it be more balanced? You know, that's not a discussion for today. That's a discussion for other people as well. But that's where it goes to. And I think the challenge for a student athlete is, if I'm passionate about my sport, I'm a volleyball player, and all of a sudden you're telling me it shouldn't be as important in my life, and I've been participating in soccer since I was six years old, and I dreamed about playing in college, and now I get to college, and my coach loves me, and my coach is supporting me, but everywhere else on campus, people are telling me to de-emphasize that part of my life. That's, that's a conflict, that's a problem, and so I think that you, the student affairs, and the student support business, need to understand that, because they're looking for more support, they're looking for validation, because certainly some faculty will say they're spending too much time on athletics. Others on campus will say that, but it fits. They wouldn't change it if they had an option. They just want some people to understand where they're coming from. Priorities, sleep, wellness, social life, not a lot of time. And this is where our student athletes are not participating in your, in your um, programming events. It might simply be they just don't have the time, so don't take it personal. This is a, a big thing I just wanted to touch upon. That's from the video. This young lady says, the bigger part of us than our friends and family can even understand, meaning this commitment, this time that they put in, they invest. They know they're not going to become professional swimmers or lacrosse players, but they do it anyway just because they love it, and this is what they want people to understand. If they feel their friends and family have a difficult time understanding it. How do you think they feel when being a student or a residence hall person, you know, is questioning their commitment or their priority? It's part of who they are, which is an interesting thing to look at. As you look at 
some research that the MTA has done. There's an article I reference in the notes that you can get. Uh, faculty uh, members at Loyola University conducted some research with our own student athletes about their time as a major issue. But they found that identity is another big thing. They identify as athletes. But you know what, they identify as students too. And one thing that I found in my own work, and again, you take football and men's basketball out of the mix, maybe baseball. They, and especially on small liberal arts campuses, highly academic institutions in particular, student athletes actually feel slighted and prejudged for being less than they are academically. They feel others on campus perceive them to be not as bright. That stereotype idea again. And for those student athletes, it bothers them. I'm not sure if you've ever come against this, but it was clear to me in multiple sessions that I've conducted with student athletes, it bothers them. How dare you think I'm not as good a student as you are? But not only that, and this is something you all can help with, they sometimes feel it from faculty. Faculty carry this prejudice sometimes, and it bothers student athletes. It's who they are, don't tell them who they are is not valid. It's a big part of what student athletes are looking for. You also know that maybe student athletes tend to be overachievers. Again, especially maybe small colleges, non-scholarship, Division three environment, they tend to take on too many things. In high school, they were able to do everything and do it well. They get to college and there's an adjustment and they tend to want to stay at the same level and doing everything as possible and they realize it's not possible and they become overachievers, turning to overcommitted and it's, it's difficult for them to stay focused. Student support, understanding what they're going through, where can you help them is the message. Understanding their daily challenges. They have their lives as student athletes, as athletes. They've got their friends, social life. Sometimes they're put in awkward situations in the middle of two groups, and all of a sudden they're conflicted. Real quick example of simply, um, say I want to become a part of a fraternity or sorority, and there's pledge activities. All of a sudden, well, they can't because they have to travel to the away game. It's a classic example. Well, my sorority says I need to be at this function. What am I supposed to do? And the sorority <coughs> leaders are saying, hey, you got to be here. Otherwise, I guess you don't want to be a part of our organization. They go back talk to their coach, and their coach says, sorority, come on, sorority, come on, you don't need Greek life. It's not important. All of a sudden, they're in the middle, and this 17, 18, maybe 19 year old first year student is going to call it. Who do I disappoint? And they start questioning who they are, the decisions they have to make. And so oftentimes there's no place to turn. So the example is bringing coaches, Greek life staff together, figure something out. Because those are two very important parts of campus life. There's got to be a way to figure it out. Collaboration. Work cloud from a sampling of student affairs divisions. What do you see? Students, the community, learning, development. Key words there. This is a sampling of athletic mission statements. Some overlap between the school. Students, development, skills, leadership, opportunity. My point here is very similar, okay? Student affairs and athletic mission statements, if they are not already, need to be talked about together and make sure Excuse that there's alignment. Is this your... Because you're doing the same work mm -hmm. with the same purposes. Because we want to change the board about Under what we do like resources, I'll talk about the post student athletes. Thank you. Come right back. They're not the only ones. Athletic trainers are a great resource. There's so much talk that happens in the training room. Trainers know, and we have a trainer in the room. Trainers know more about it than lives than the coaches even. And that's no problem. So there are places you can go, student athlete services staff, the larger school, maybe. These people are going to know student athletes better than student affairs athletes, resident small staff, most likely. So you need to be able to bring these people to the table and have meaningful discussions. idea behind the assessment, you all know about assessment, right? But develop what it is you're trying to do. What do you want from your student experience?
experience and student care. What do you want from your student after the experience? Most things are so similar, have those discussions together. But develop some sort of plan and some sort of plan for measuring it so that you can get the feedback that says, are we doing a good job? Not only does it give you meaningful feedback, the fact that you ask student athletes about their experiences is huge. Many campuses conduct some sort of season ending evaluation. Usually it's focused only on coaches as a part of the eval process. But if you start to ask student athletes what is working, what's not working, what can we do better, they actually value it. They, they start to register that, wow, these people care, they actually understand my world. And if some sort of assessment like this came from student affairs, it would be even bigger because it's outside of the athletic world. Also provides you with a way to demonstrate some due diligence. Okay? Have you been paying attention to what's going on in your athletic department? We've all seen the Rutgers case, the ABC University case, XYZ case, where all of a sudden coaching behavior is a real hot topic. How could you have no idea that some of these things are going on? And in some cases, for student athletes, where do they turn? Where do they have a place to voice their concerns? And if it's not a safe environment, okay, it's even more difficult because they don't want to jeopardize their status, their scholarship, whatever it might be. Lastly, if you ask, you engage student athletes, you actually just might learn something. There are things that we all assume we know about our program, and for the most part, our assumptions are generally true. So part of the assessment process here I'm talking about will validate, yeah, we knew that this was working, we knew that there's some work to be done in this area, but there's always been, in my experience, cases where, wow, we had no idea that that particular thing was an issue. We had no idea, we knew the dining hall hours were an issue because it comes up right against the end of practice, so we, we've been working on hours, but the other issue there is the quality of food that's left right before they close the doors. Wow, we didn't think about that. So it's another issue, that's my point, that there's always something to work. Vince Lombardi, coach knows best, this is my pitch again for utilizing coaches. The relationship between coaches and student athletes begins usually in their junior year of high school. They develop relationships with not only the student, but their families. The relationship continues throughout their college career and beyond. <coughs> and they become alumni, good alumni, and the coach is a key conduit there to you. There is no person on campus that will develop a stronger relationship with a student than his or her coach. I firmly believe that. And that's a quote uh, by me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, if you want, I, that's, that's me. Leverage the coach-student athlete relationship in your work. So for instance, a quick example is, uh, my experience, and I know other places do this, we involve coaches uh, within the whole residential life judicial board process. We had an agreement, signed agreements, where if ever a student athlete was written up, accused of something, immediately their coach was notified. And it just helped expedite either confession or get to the bottom of it. I mean, it just helped move things along. Students didn't care if Dean of Campus Life found out that they screwed up. They cared if the coach knew. They cared because there might be other consequences. That's a whole other story. But they don't want to disappoint their coach. Okay, so think about that. As we transition, think about those relationships on your campus, those people that you work with, maybe want to work with, or now think maybe we need to work with more closely. Think about who those people are and make a note to reach out to them next week. Now, please, thank you for uh, letting me yap at you for a little bit. It's time for a break. Mark McCorney, Benedictine University. I'm going to stand up here just because it's a bit of a mind like a chipmunk. They let me loose down here. I'll be bouncing back and forth and <laughs> distracting you guys as well. Um, for, thanks, Mark, for, for letting me share kind of a little bit about what we do here. Um, we have 
uh, a, I think a unique situation, but personally for me, I've been fortunate. I have a five-year-old who's taught me a lot just along, along the lines, and one of those is, I think uh, yesterday I've heard a lot about, you know, we need students to know who they are, and, and who they are, and who they are, and who they are, and, and I think that goes for us as, as professionals also, but I think it's key to, to just remember the perceptions of those as well. And, and my five-year-old at our university, uh, any American Idol fans, it's okay. It's okay. Um, my five-year-old is a huge fan of Philip Phillips. How that happened, I have no clue. But Phil Phillips came to sing at Benedictine last year, and being the good father, I decided to, to use my ability to try and get her in the meet and greet. Um, so I was very strategic about how I, I came to campus that day, um, not to, to upset the, the people that were hosting the event. I, I tried to go underneath um, our offices through our fitness center and come up and, and sneak into my office so that I could just get her there, get her fed, and then get her in the meet and greet and then get the heck out of there before someone knew what happened. Um, as we're walking down this corridor, uh, Philip Phillips and, and one of his bandmates uh, comes walking down there playing frisbee in the arena and my, my daughter, I, I kind of was a little worried about what may happen. Um, and she didn't recognize him, thankfully. Um, and, and she held the door open for him as he was going up the same stairway. So our ability to stay inconspicuous and be on the, below the radar did not work. Uh, as we get to the top of the stairs, he says, hey, little lady, let me open the door for you. She says, thank you. And he kind of turns his way and, and we go our way. And I, I, I kind of looked down and said, Aubrey, do you know who that was? She goes, no, I, I don't. And I said, I think that's Philip Phillips. And she looked at me and she said, Dad, he didn't even recognize us. <laughs> I thought, um, I think from a perception standpoint, um, that was definitely a, a moment where you just kind of, you don't realize it, I think, at the moment, but, you know, reflecting and, and just driving aimlessly in the car, all of a sudden you kind of realize that, you know, five-year-olds can really teach us something. Uh, how important it is to know who you are is, is definitely important, but I also think it's remembered to, to, to understand how you're going to be perceived. And student athletes have that. They, they have that where they, they don't necessarily know that, but athletic departments have it as well. And from our side of things, I think it's important to know, um, one, who we are and, and where we, we fit in our campus and, and where we fit within, within the student affairs or student life. At our university, um, you know, we know that. Our, our athletic department is very important to the recruitment and the retention of student athletes. Uh, it's important for us to, to know the student learning outcomes of the university and sit down with the academic folks and understand that. And then talk to our coaches about how we can incorporate that into to practice and game preparation and, and the rest of it. Um, you know, the big thing is, is understanding why. And, and I think when you're, you're looking for people to collaborate, and, and I apologize if, if I'm getting too, uh, too uh, like a, a teacher, but uh, I think if, if we know why we're doing things and we find common ground and, and then collaboration can begin, and, and I'm a, a firm believer in deep collaboration, not just collaboration, we know what that is, calling someone up saying, hey, you want to help us out? Yeah, and then you both show up at the same event and neither one of you did anything, right? That's, that's kind of a collaboration. I'm talking about deep, meaningful collaboration to get things accomplished and get things done, but if you can find the common why, you're already there. And in athletics, at least on our campus, I can't speak for other campuses, but I know that we have the same why. We have the same why as student affairs. We are here to help students along the path. And it's crystal clear. All of our coaches know that. We interview looking for people like that. And, and then we try to model that behavior as we go by. We try to professionally develop our own staff. It's okay. It's okay for them to leave. It's okay. Uh, they're good enough, you bring them back, right? Um, the other part is our university is, is just announced the Benedictine Promise, so one of the things that we are doing in athletics is kind of our answer to that, and we'll get into that a little bit. Um, one of the questions we do get is, is how, do you, how do these units do this stuff together? And I can only speak from my brief experience, but I can tell you we've assisted in RA selection, um, you know, in that whole process. And, and student athletes can be good RAs, right? But we talk about the time thing, and where is the time thing? And all of a sudden you got training, but they got practice. And, you know, the only person who's not putting that on them is themselves, right? It's, it's external. It's the athletics, it's the coaches, it's the, the student affairs residence life division. 
Um, so they do feel that, that burden, and they, they, it, that hurts them. They don't want to have to always pick and choose. And, and I think if anyone in here have uh, some familiarity with fundraising, right? One of the things we always hear in fundraising is let the donor pick, right? Well, they're not even a student, right? It's just their money, so they get to pick. Well, for us, the student is paying for their education, right? Let them have some ownership in that, and, and it's okay. And, and everyone in deep collaboration, everyone's got to give a little anyway. Right? Coaches have to give, athletics have to give, sometimes the residents life areas. So we see that. Uh, programming inclusion, it's very important to jump in together and do things as, as a group. And what we found in our campus is if, if, you're, if you're student affairs or your student life division and, and you feel your cash strapped and your budget is as tight as it can get, sometimes there's other places to, to press that release a, a little bit. And, and athletics is, is one area where sometimes you can find additional funds for programming. And I, I, I apologize for anyone who's in athletics if I'm giving them the assumption that you have a, a, a limited cash flow. But it's an area of value, and, and I think um, it's unique, and, and athletic administrators would want to get behind that. Uh, understanding the long-term vision of student life, know what that is. Um, it's okay to, to, to share that with coaches. They're the ones recruiting. They're out, they're out the front lines for the university. It's okay to share your vision and, and what you see. Uh, the other thing, uh, you know, we get involved in is the on-campus behavior, and I know that was a popular topic early. Uh, we have a dedicated professional who, who attends a meeting with our police department, our residence life staff. Um, there's a handful of other people there, and they discuss those issues. Uh, and, and I know that, I think, I, you know, you see head nod, that that is sometimes a hot button for, for people, and, and maybe they feel coaches don't take that as serious. And, um, it, you know, that comes down to the people a little bit. But the other thing I learned from my five-year-old is when I dropped her off for kindergarten this year, they announced this PBIS. I have no idea what this is, but it's a po positive behavior um, model. And they give them high fives. What a great idea. And athletics people give each other high fives all the time. So, so uh, we kind of have been discussing in our group how we can plug that in. Because too many times we're, we're always focusing on the negative behavior on campus. And I don't know what could happen if we start to focus on the 95% of the students that do things right. You see reward systems for career development, career advancement, reward system for showing up at games and being a fan. Well, why do we not have a reward system for positive behavior? And where would that go? I have no idea. We're going to try and figure it out. Uh, then understand the vehicle we're in. In athletics, we, we understand that sometimes we, we get put as the, the square peg and trying to shave our corners to get in the round hole. Uh, but at the same time, we also understand that we, we potentially are, are a nice revenue generation for a university through tuition dollars. We're also a nice marketing vehicle from time to time. And I, I think we have students engaged. And we, we provide, on our campus, 78 opportunities for somebody to jump in and be part of an event. 78 free opportunities for anyone who wants to program, whether it be a football game, a basketball game, a baseball game, a lacrosse match, um, whatever it may be, we have those opportunities and they're, they're free to you to use. Uh, some of the other things we get as we, we go through is, is uh, our commitment to student athlete success. And this is a little new for us. We're, uh, we've announced our, our, uh, our source strategy. We don't have a strategic plan because those end. Uh, we have a strategy that goes through time and we can adjust when we want. But our, our source strategy is service, opportunity, accountability, and respect. Our mascots, the Eagles. Eagles fly high, they're, they're you know, leaders and, and all this stuff. So, oh, one more. One more? Oh, I'm sorry. There you go. That's a nice picture of an eagle. Um, <laughs> so for us, for us, it's, it's uh, it, 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 the question comes, you know, what are we doing to deliver value to liberal arts education? And, and we've heard that heard that and heard that and, and you know what that's my profession I take offense to that I, I think I've tried to <coughs> provide value to students and I think our coaches do and our staff do so what we've done is is in response to that and, and in our answer to the, the Benedict and promise and where we're gonna you know take you from from recruitment to death and be with you every step of the way whatever it is we're gonna help you that's our that's what our universities come out and said so athletically we look at that and say well what are we doing and what can we do to be behind it? And we understood that we can't lead it, right? It's not ours to, it's, it's not ours, but we can help. Because I think our 500 student athletes, when they see we're behind it and we're, we're helping push the boulder, per se, with other groups on campus, they'll understand that, that hey, they care. 
they do care. They care more about me with, than, than points on the boards that, that they want me to get a job. And so what we've done is, is we've gone out and we've grabbed the student affairs, <coughs> alumni development, advancement, our enrollment office, our police department, uh, the deans in our four colleges, uh, local businesses and organizations, as well as our local chamber of commerce, and we have we have developed a program, a curriculum, if you would, with their assistance and, and their input, to move our students from freshman year and sophomore year, where it's about development, to junior year, where it's about refinement, and then to senior year, where it's about polish. Our goal is that we want them all to have jobs. We want them all to have jobs. We we want to connect them to employment. And, and we're okay saying that. We want, you know, 90% of our students to have jobs within six months. Um, that's what we're trying to do. It, it is new, it's, it's different. Um, both our, our results on campus from, from this collaboration, this deep collaboration, have been very positive. We actually have people emailing asking if they can teach sessions. And we don't get, you know, people emailing us a ton asking, asking for us to be able to do things and, and things like that. And, um, you, you know, for us, I think it's our, our ability to reach out and help those other departments try to program and do some things is key. Because many times athletics is like, we're the anchor. You know, we need you. We need you. You know, we have to start giving back. And this is our answer to that. Uh, I think the other part of that is, is understanding the accountability and accepting that. As uh, coaches and administrators, sometimes we, we do steer away from that stuff from time to time. But it's all important. We need to do that. Um, so for me, that is it. Don't let the slide cut you short. Are you okay. I'm really quick. We'll transition. I know that uh, we're only you know touching upon some things to get you thinking. Okay. Mark will stick around. I'm going to stick around. We'll have cards up here if you need contact information. Other information will be available as well. But Mark, thank you for that. Mark is doing some things in a way that I think is really, really important not common, and that's why I asked him to be a part of this. He's really trying to make a difference and really leading the charge. David Williams, uh, who I mentioned, fortunately is not able to be here. Great person and would have been a great representative of the big school environment. Real briefly, uh, I wanted him to at least use some of his words, and they're not directed at us necessarily, but they're still good words. There is no question in my mind that David Williams has successfully led this effort not only on the field, but off the field, to really bring athletics into the heart of the university and to really have Vanderbilt as the shining star of the student athlete. Today, that David is our Vice Chancellor for Athletics and University Affairs and Athletic Director of this great Vanderbilt University. David will remain as a tenured professor of law at Vanderbilt Law School, where he will continue to teach not-for-profit tax law, tax law, sports law, and many other subjects. It, it's, it's sort of gratifying. I mean, Nick and I had the great uh, good fortune to be at the SEC meetings in May, and it's kind of nice to sit around and realize the smallest school in the SEC, the only private school in the SEC, the SEC school that has the highest academic standards, uh, has not only the highest grade point of all of the schools, in the SEC, not only the best APR, but was one of only two of the schools that had four of their four revenue sports in postseason in the same year. Director of Athletics, David Williams. <laughs> this is truly a multi-use facility. Obviously, it will benefit our athletic department, but the key thing in Vanderbilt's style is this is for the whole university community. It's actually for the community, and in fact, we're already scheduling uh, events for some of the high schools in here and other things. So the great part about it is while it will clearly help our athletic teams, it's a very, very, very positive addition to the university community. Uh, the athletic teams will use it a certain percentage of the time, not even 50% of the time, and then it'll be used for other activities. Our club sports will be in here. Uh, faculty and staff and students can come in here and jog. And as I said, we'll have some high school track meets in here.
to integrating athletics and student athletes into the whole educational experience, which is a big part of what we're talking about here. David is a very busy guy. <laughs> He's always still a tenured law professor there. He's been supervising a number of campus units. He came out of the student affairs uh, world, by the way, before he uh, took over athletics. Uh, just an interesting place to demonstrate you can compete at the highest level athletically. The SEC is arguably the best athletic conference. You know, I'm from the West Coast, so I argue that often. With you. But it also is one of the premier academic institutions, and they do it as well as anybody in terms of committing to the student athlete experience. One of the examples they're going to talk about is they have a student study abroad program. Study abroad is a big part of what they offer there. Athletes, especially at the Division I level, when are they going to go? Spring semester, fall semester? It doesn't work. So they created, in collaboration with the university, a summer study, study abroad program that services primarily student athletes, but it provides them with the same opportunity, just fits within what can work for student athletes. And that goes back to Mark mentioned this. You can't all try to force a square peg into a round hole. You need to figure out ways to shave the edges off. And that's what collaboration is. And so Vanderbilt is a great, great resource. And I think that uh, Candace Lee is our senior woman administrator, really involved in a lot of this type of programming. David has lots of things to, to worry about. But David really has been instrumental in Vanderbilt's transformation into the, the program that they are today. Um, suggestions and advice really from Vanderbilt was about uh, making sure that you value them as students. Don't look at them as student athletes. Make sure that you see them. Ongoing assessment is a big part of what Vanderbilt does. How are they doing? When they come in as freshmen, you need to get a read. And then how are they progressing through their time there? Mark talked about deep collaboration and deep meaning, meaningful. Not just partnering on an event, but planning and being a part of it. Be different, be bold, be willing to do something that's different, and keep score is kind of the whole idea. How are we doing? That's the idea that we're all trying to get at here is to make it meaningful. So your task, again, is to what is one thing, one area, one person that you can engage next week when you go home from this conference, or tomorrow, but one thing. And if you can take action on it, you will move things forward. We focus on the negative stuff we want to fix. That's just easier. But it might be something that's going well, but you can take it to a different level. That counts, too. What can you take action on to make a difference? That's what you need to think about. And before we summarize, just are there any questions? We've got just about three minutes left. You want to be able to entertain questions. Yes? Hi. Um, I'm Rebecca Wendover. I'm from Kent State University, a grad student. And I'm a former Division III on positive student athlete. And a lot of what you talked about is the collaboration between student affairs and athletics, which I think is so important. But what I'm asking is for the audience and for yourself, what are you doing to focus on the LGBTQ student athlete? Because right now in the media, that is huge. It's always been an issue. Right now, we're actually taking a stand and promoting it. But what are we doing in athletics to actually focus on the DHLA model that we hear all as student affair practitioners to bring it to athletics and ask the questions to our student athletes rather than just focusing on the non-student athlete? How are you struggling? Are you struggling? Are you not struggling? Process, but actually ending the homophobia in sports, etc. I, well, I think it's a huge issue, you're right, and that's why there are there's not a session here on that, but it is a huge topic within the NCAA as well, and a lot of discussion taking place. It was outside of the scope of this focus discussion, so that's that's my simple response. Now I'd like to hear from a Catholic institution. <laughs> <laughs> What's happening on their campus? I think um, you know, I, I think at the end of your, your question statement, the, the, the term struggling was, was used. And I think for us, it's having that conversation in, in outside of athletics first. If, if, if we don't do that to the university, we, we start standing wherever we want on our own with our issue. We have to have that, that conversation and even initiate it with campus leaders to, to get to that and to, to find that out. And, and at a private institution, um, 
you, you know, whether it be Benedictine or, or any other school that, that's private in the country, those are difficult conversations to, to engage in, in, you know, the uh, university leadership and where it starts. And a lot of those institutions, it comes down from, from university leadership where, where you're going to end up. And, and for us, I would say that's where we're, we have to get to. We have to get to those conversations. And it's new for us. We have not had that issue on our campus. Um, so we need to begin that process. That's, that's where we're at. Um, besides Vanderbilt, is there other schools that you would ask us, you would suggest we look to um, U of O, neighbors right down the street? And I think there's definitely a different vibe when you have that public. Yeah, don't look at U of O. does a really good job, I think, as well. Um, those are three that just come to the top of my head. And those might be obvious. I think there are others that do it well. The, the uh, uh, Patriot League School, Lehigh, uh, Davidson, you know, those types of that are really small liberal arts colleges tend to get it right. Um, whether they're a BCS or not makes a, makes a difference yeah. because of the money.